the stunning waters of the Chesapeake Bay. From the Chesapeake and Delaware Canal to the open waters of the bay and the towns, cities, and estates surrounding. Preserving the Chesapeake Bay's maritime heritage. We have the largest collection of indigenous Chesapeake watercraft in the world. Exploring the cultural fabric of Baltimore. Artists participate in artivism, you know, activists through what we create. And the birthplace of a civil rights pioneer. Harriet Tubman was a conductor on the Underground Railroad. She took over 300 slaves to freedom. Now, 50,000 kilometers of eastern coastline are revealed from above. An aerial journey over America's rugged Atlantic frontier. This is America over the edge. Just inland from the United States Atlantic coast, the Chesapeake Delaware Canal connects the Delaware River and the city of Philadelphia with the Chesapeake Bay and the city of Baltimore. This narrow man-made canal is located at the northern end of the Delmarva Peninsula. It was designed to eliminate the 500 kilometer maritime route around the Delaware, Maryland shoreline. And from above, we can appreciate the scope of this effort. A 22 kilometer long project that began as a shallow channel in the early 19th century. Over time, the waterway has expanded to the 10 meter deep, 137 meter wide passage that exists today. The Chesapeake-Delaware Canal is the busiest of its kind for marine traffic in the world, used by 15,000 vessels each year. As a result, six bridges have been built above to accommodate land traffic. The William V. Roth Jr. Bridge, also known simply as the C&D Canal Bridge, is a concrete and cable-stayed structure nearly 1.5 kilometers long. It is 30 meters high, designed to allow vessels traveling from Philadelphia to Baltimore safe passage below. And to the west, the Chesapeake and Delaware Lift Bridge is a different type of span altogether. It is the only drawbridge left on the canal used to carry the Norfolk Southern Rail Line on approach, train engineers must contact the bridge authority and the span is lowered. But once rail traffic is passed, the span slides up the bridge's outer structure to its current position, providing 30 meters clearance below. Continuing west, a bend in the Chesapeake-Delaware Canal marks a political boundary as we leave Delaware and enter the state of Maryland. And in Maryland, just beyond Chesapeake City, the canal reaches its westernmost point. Here, the waters widen as we trace the contours of the Elk River. From the sky, the natural splendor of the Chesapeake Bay region begins to appear. From the Maryland mainland on the left to the Elk Neck Peninsula on the right. And 15 kilometers southwest, the Elk Neck Peninsula leads to Turkey Point. 
here, the Turkey Point Light is an historic landmark, rising 39 meters above the water. It has been guiding mariners since 1833 and marks a geographic boundary as we leave the Elk River behind and soar above the vast waters of the Chesapeake Bay. Heading southwest from Turkey Point, we trace the eastern shoreline of the Chesapeake Bay. From high above, we gain a unique understanding of the landscapes and communities lining this inland coast. Flying over Cecil County, farmland extends as far as the eye can see. This northeast corner of Maryland devotes one third of its land, some 76,000 acres, to agriculture. Farmers here produce corn, soybeans, and wheat. In total, agriculture in Cecil County is worth more than $113 million each year. Moving down the coast, we see a unique geographic feature of the bay. Peninsulas, creeks, and inlets branch out in all directions, forming a sprawling, scenic coast. And at the southern edge of Kent County, the town known as the Pearl of the Chesapeake appears on the horizon. Rock Hall was an important center of trade as far back as the American Revolution, exporting local agricultural products, as well as animal skins from the west and tobacco brought from the south. Today, Rock Hall is a sailing, fishing, and recreation town, home to some 1,300 people. Continuing south, we leave the Maryland mainland on approach to Eastern Neck Island. Here, the Eastern Neck Wildlife Refuge is part of the larger Chesapeake Marshlands National Wildlife Refuge. From above, we can see the change in landscape. Trees growing up from soft wetlands surrounded by tiny streams. Eastern Neck Wildlife Refuge measures 2,285 acres and helps protect 243 species of birds. Further offshore, we soar high above the Chesapeake Bay, as well as the sheltered waters of Eastern Bay and the Miles River. Here, we explore a cultural feature of the bay, the life of the Chesapeake Bay's watermen. Well, a waterman is our term for a commercial fisherman, and that encompasses anything from oysters to clams to crabs to eels to fish, all of the fisheries, it encompasses all of the fisheries right here in the, in the Chesapeake Bay region. It is a tradition that goes back generations. The traditions of a Chesapeake Bay waterman go back pre-Civil War. Um, at one time, in fact, there's pictures from Captain John Smith when he came up to Chesapeake Bay and stories of, uh, there's drawings of the Indians harvesting crabs and oysters and stories of when Captain John Smith, when they got low on food, or harvesting oysters. So I suppose they were the first watermen. After the Civil War, many of the newly freed slaves turned to the water to make a living because even though slavery, their emancipation had been declared, they still couldn't just go out and get a job. But the Chesapeake Bay don't know what color you are. So out there they went and harvest seafood they did and they became 
Waterman just the same. They work right alongside 1865. They work right alongside of a white waterman, and they've been treated equal on the Chesapeake Bay ever since. Today, thousands of watermen work the waters of the Chesapeake Bay. The job changes each season, and it's never easy. In this general area, mostly trot lining is done, and a trot liner's day starts between 3 and 3.30 a.m. He goes out, catch, he lays his line, he goes over and over, back and forth, up and down his line until about lunchtime, maybe 1 o'clock, then he pulls his line up with whatever amount of crabs he has, hopefully enough to pay his bills. And at that point, he comes home and spends three or four more hours baiting up his trot line to be ready for the next day and fueling up and getting his baskets, selling his crabs. So if he really hustles quick, he can make it in until a 12-hour day, but most of them are 14 hours. I think that's an interesting thing. This one piece will make 52 layers. Watch on mobile devices or the big screen. All for free. No subscription required. It is a tough job. It, it's commercial fishing. It is dangerous, and it's not just dangerous, but it's a challenging way of life. It, and that's what it is. It's not just a job. It's a way of life. It's it's what what we it's who we are, along with what we do. And we're doing our best through legislation and public awareness and environmental issues to try to hand that heritage down to the next generation. And here in the town of St. Michael's, one facility is dedicated to the preservation of the fishing traditions of the Chesapeake Bay. Richard Schofield is with the Chesapeake Bay Maritime Museum. The museum tries to preserve the culture of the Chesapeake Bay, primarily the uh, waterman's culture, the harvesting of the bay. We have the largest collection of indigenous Chesapeake watercraft in the world. If you want to preserve that culture and understand that culture, the most viable symbol of that are the workboats. And we have pretty much one of every style on display. To maintain the museum's incredible collection of watercraft, there's a working boatyard on site. Mike Gorman, a former shipwright apprentice here, runs this one-of-a-kind operation. So as you walk around campus here, you're going to see 13 boats um, ranging in size from like 26 foot up to Edna Lockwood, which was built in 1889. And they're all collected for their great stories and their importance to the bay. And in this shop right here is where we do all the maintenance on them. We do all the major restoration work, all the timber work. And in, in moving forward, we're even going to have a sawmill here. So we'll be taking everything right from a tree right to the boats that we own the whole process. So the latest project we did over the winter was this log canoe. And this is a uh, indigenous craft that we sort of stole from the Native Americans here, where they do dugout canoes. And when the Europeans came, they took logs and pinned them together because they wanted bigger boats. We did this project as practice uh, for building with logs because we're going to be doing a rebuild of our Edna Lockwood Bug Eye, which is 60 foot, and it's nine logs pinned together. That was built in 1889. So this is all sort of R&D and kind of a good example of what we do at the museum is preserving not only boats but uh, craft and the way that it would have been done originally. Inside, Gorman is putting the finishing touches on the project. So we built a set of masts here for the log canoe we just looked at. And we went out racing, and the masts are just a bit too heavy. So what we're going to do is start changing the shape of this mast and getting it lightened up for uh, so we can go faster. You know, you can see what I'm doing. We're just changing the shape down to make it, make it a lot lighter. I got into boat building through kind of always um, all my educations and working with my hands, uh, a lot of furniture building, and then went end up going to trade school for um, boat building. 
After I graduated from boat building school, I went sailing and ran out of money about like five miles from here and uh, kind of came in and got a job as an apprentice here. I think when you're building a boat, seeing the bigger picture is a huge, huge importance in it. Um, if you focus on all these little pieces along the way, you'll be doing it forever. But once you grasp that bigger picture and how everything works together, your job will be a lot easier for you. Back on the water, the bigger picture can be seen in the Chesapeake Bay Maritime Museum's floating fleet. A dozen amazing watercraft. One of those vessels is the Rosie Parks, built in 1955 and recently restored to its original state. Today, Richard Schofield is assessing the work. Rosie Parks is the museum skipjack. She is, when she was bought by the museum in 1975, she's one of the most famous skipjacks around. She was, she's very fast, she won a lot of the races, um, worked for 20 years. It's good to see her back in the water. She is, as skipjacks go, she's really, really pretty. Skipjacks are the classic boat we use for dredging oysters now in the 20th century, 21st century now. They're V-bottom dead rise hulls, plank forward after on the top sides and cross planked on the bottom. They're a very easy hull to build. Um, they were somewhat disposable. If it lasted 30 years, you made a lot of money on it and you built a new one. On board, Mike Gorman paints a picture of this success story. So what's different is it's the last working sailboat that dredges oysters in America, in North America, actually, I believe. The rollers over there on the rail is where the dredges go over. And during the working season, which is not oyster season right now, there'd be winders right here. So the dredges go over the rollers, drag behind under sail, and then you kick the winders on and it pulls them in. And then the crew of four dumps the dredges right here and they call through and pick out all the good oysters, put them in bushel baskets and they sit on deck and they, uh, they dredge all day. As far as a sailboat, it being a sailboat, this is called a leg of mutton rig. It's just a really huge sloop rig. Skipjacks are always all different, but they're all built to the same parameters. So basically what you do is you decide how big of a boat you want and everything else is built to that. Right now, we're operating under uh, full sail with no jib. If we were out working right now, we'd probably have two or three reefs in the main and have the jib up with a reef in it. It's uh, more about power than speed for these boats working. Here on the Miles, we don't dredge oysters anymore, so it's nice to be out on a skipjack in the Miles River. For Richard Schofield and Mike Gorman, the Chesapeake Bay Maritime Museum is conducting important research and restoration, key to preserving the cultural traditions of the Chesapeake Bay. They hope it will continue into the future. This is my hometown. The museum was started by very good friends of my grandparents. I mean, it's been a part of my life since it started. I work on wooden boats. This is, this is what I do. It's important to preserve the boats that we have here and sort of the culture in general because um, the way that the population's expanding and the access to this region, which was so isolated for so long, and it's rapidly changing. More and more uh, families that were sort of rooted in the eastern shore are moving away. That really distinct determination of the people has started to dissolve, and a lot of their customs are going with it. So. What we try and do here is collect uh, artifacts, but also the stories and the traditions as well. And that's all really important to show people that. Ten kilometers south of the Chesapeake Bay Maritime Museum, we explore the settlements along the bay's eastern shore. The town of Oxford is one of the oldest European settlements in the state. Founded in 1683, it was named the Eastern Chesapeake Bay's first international port by the Maryland State Assembly. 
The town quickly became a bustling marine hub with British vessels coming and going. Up until the American Revolution, Oxford was a major center for international trade. Centuries later, from the sky, it is clear that seafaring legacy lives on. Oxford is known as a vacation destination, drawing recreational boaters from all over the Chesapeake Bay. And south of Oxford, the modern day wealth and prosperity of the region can be seen. All along the Chesapeake East Coast, Incredible mansions and estates line the inlets, creeks, and winding waterways here. While some of these homes can be seen from the roadways lining the coast, the true scope of these Chesapeake estates can only be understood from a bird's eye view. This stretch of Chesapeake has been admired for its beauty for centuries. Documented by explorer John Smith, who wrote, Heaven and earth never agreed better to frame a place for man's habitation. Next, we head east from the bay, up the Choptank River, en route to the city of Cambridge. Like Oxford, it is a Maryland community with centuries of tradition. The Choptank Native Americans, who the river is named after, were the first to inhabit these shores. They were followed by English colonists who built elaborate plantations growing tobacco and other crops. But those plantations required labor and Cambridge became a major center for the slave trade. Today, reminders of that legacy can be seen throughout the Cambridge region, especially in the village of Bucktown, which marks the birthplace of one of America's great civil rights pioneers. One of the most famous residents in Dorchester County is Harriet Tubman. Harriet Tubman was a conductor on the Underground Railroad. She came back 19 times, said she took over 300 slaves to freedom. She came back and forth for her family. And um, we're here in front of the Bucktown Village door because this is a site where she committed her first known act of defiance. And inside the village store, mementos of the era and stories of Tubman's life are preserved. My favorite part of the store when people come in is I like to show them the dip in the floor and how many people it would take to make an, a dip in the floor like that that's come in before you. This is the original store. They believe that it was probably about an 1860 remodel. So during the end of the Civil War, it was remodeled. Susan represents the fourth generation of Merediths to maintain this store. She says they have worked hard to care for these symbols of the past and mementos from the lives of slaves who lived in Bucktown. Historians believe that this mortar is something that was tribal, that was brought here, an innovation by the slaves. And so we don't have the pestle, but the grain is still in it. It was in a house in Cambridge, and we brought it, bought it right out of the slave quarters. And so um, we believe that this was an in innovation brought here by them to grind and mill the corn and wheat. And so this is actually out of a slave cabin and um, it's absolutely authentic. But some symbols reveal a frightening reality for black residents of this era. 
So these are slave tags. So slave tags would be like when you were in school and you had a pass to go to the bathroom. Then they would ask you, what are you doing here and where's your pass? So slaves wore them around their neck. They always said where the slave was from. So if they had run away, people would take them back to where the slave tags said. So they wore them around their neck and that gave them permission to go places and nobody would ask them anything because they had permission to be away. And it was in this store that Harriet Tubman, also known as Minty, was recorded performing her first act of defiance on the way to becoming a civil rights pioneer. Here in Bucktown, she had been leased to a local slave owner. Leased is when um, you belong to a slave owner, but somebody in the neighborhood needs extra work, so they pay you to use your slave. So that's what she was doing, but she was only 13, and he was using her to work with flax. And the day that she um, was in here, she's in here shopping, there's another customer in the store, and all of a sudden, everybody hears this yelling, and a slave boy runs in the store, and when he does, the overseer runs in behind him, tells Minty and another customer in the store to hold the boy while he whips him. So she obviously was not going to hold him, so she started yelling at 13 years old, knowing what that could have meant to her. All of a sudden, the slave boy starts inching out the door, and when he does, Thomas Barnett grabs up the closest thing he can find, which is a two-pound counterweight. He takes it, he hurls it at the boy to stop him, and accidentally hits Minty right in the forehead. She falls out, and from that day on, she suffered from narcolepsy, most people um, refer to it. And back then, they called it the dreaded sleeping disease. She was asked up north if she was, um, angry at the man who gave her the scar on her forehead and the dreaded sleeping disease. And she said, heck no, God uses everything in our lives to make us who and what we are. She said, it's during the hardest times of your life that show what your true character is. And she said, if that hadn't happened to me, I'd have never been successful in my life. She said, because you suppose that I'm asleep. She said, but I'm not asleep. God's showing me visions. He's telling me to say this. He's telling me to do that. And she said, so no, I'm not angry with him at all. Susan Meredith says that while Bucktown is a largely remote and rural area, the stories contained here are important for the future of Maryland and America. The story of Harriet Tubman um, is very important to me and it should be to everybody because she was just a regular everyday average person. She was no superpower. She was somebody who had determination and hopes and dreams. She had tradition of her family. So she came back to bring, bring her family into freedom. And um, after civil rights, she started fighting for women's rights. And um, she was just somebody that I would say, most people would say wore rose colored glasses. Back to the Chesapeake shoreline and moving north, we head for Maryland's state capital, Annapolis, also known as America's sailing capital. Along the way, beyond the Thomas Shoal Lighthouse, we encounter a great example of that seafaring heritage. This is the tall ship, Pride of Baltimore II, also known as America's Star-Spangled Ambassador. It's a recreation of an 1812-era topsail schooner, a class of ship known as a Baltimore Clipper, popular during the War of 1812. The Pride of Baltimore II was commissioned in 1988 to replace its predecessor, the Pride of Baltimore, that was sunk tragically off Puerto Rico. From the sky, we get a rare perspective of a maritime masterpiece. 33 meters long, eight meters across, and more than 900 square meters of sail. It is amazing to imagine a vessel like this chasing down British ships in the Chesapeake Bay in the heat of battle. Since its construction, the Pride of Baltimore II has sailed more than 300,000 kilometers and visited 200 ports in 40 countries. 100,000 guests board the ship each year. 
The Pride of Baltimore II is recognized around the world with a mission to promote historical maritime education and to represent the people of Maryland. Finally, 50 kilometers northwest of Cambridge, Maryland, on the western shore of the Chesapeake Bay, we reach the city of Annapolis. Here, another style watercraft leads us to this historic shoreline. Yard patrol craft are a regular sight on this stretch of Chesapeake Bay. Their legacy dates back to World War II when the U.S. Navy convinced tuna skippers to paint their boats gray and volunteer them for service in the war. The boats served all over the world, from the South Pacific to the Panama Canal. Today, a modern fleet of yard patrol boats are used for realistic at-sea training for aspiring midshipmen. They can travel for five days at 12 knots, covering 2,600 kilometers before refueling. And now, where the Severn River meets the Chesapeake Bay, we fly high above the city of Annapolis and the U.S. Naval Academy. From the sky, it is amazing to see the expanse of this facility. 337 acres of academic facilities, student housing, athletic fields, and the most identifiable structure, the Academy Chapel. Here in a crypt beneath the dome lies the body of John Paul Jones, considered by many to be America's first naval hero and father of the American Navy. Today, Annapolis is home to 4,500 midshipmen, or naval cadets. They can be seen all over the academy grounds. But there is more to Annapolis than the Naval Academy. Just outside the gates, Maryland's State House marks another iconic structure. It is the only State House in America still in legislative use, completed in 1779. It is also the only state capitol building to have also served as America's capital, with the Continental Congress meeting in the old Senate chamber here from November 1783 to August 1784. Just east of Annapolis and continuing north, we approach a Chesapeake Bay engineering masterpiece. The only way to drive from Maryland's rural eastern shore to the more urban western shore is by going over the Chesapeake Bay Bridge. Officially known as the William Preston Lane Jr. Bridge, after the Maryland governor who sanctioned the project, locals know it simply as the Bay Bridge. This massive project was proposed more than a century ago, but was delayed twice after the stock market crash of 1929 and again during World War II. In 1949, construction finally began. And from the air, we can appreciate the magnitude of this effort. The Bay Bridge took more than three years to complete, and when the original span opened in 1952, it marked the world's longest continuous overwater steel structure at 6.9 kilometers. A second span was added due to increasing traffic volumes. It was completed in 1973. From the east, the parallel bridges begin in Stevensville on Kent Island. 
and extend to Sandy Point State Park, just northeast of Annapolis. Twenty-five kilometers northwest of the Bay Bridge, a massive industrial complex lies at the confluence of the Patapsco River and the Chesapeake Bay. From the air, we get an almost unimaginable perspective on this massive and largely abandoned site. Sparrows Point was a steelmaking and shipbuilding center for more than a century. The Pennsylvania Steel Company first began production here in 1889, and by the mid-20th century, this was the largest steel mill in the world, more than six kilometers in length. The site was chosen for its strategic location, close to the city's labor force, and a deep water port able to bring in the essential ingredient of iron ore delivered by steamship from Cuba. In addition, 116 ships were built here between 1939 and 1946. At its height, Sparrows Point employed 31,000 people. But with changes in the steel industry, the fortunes of Sparrows Point declined. Today, there is hope a major environmental restoration of the site will take place, and that Sparrows Point may someday return to its former glory. Now, moving northwest up the Patapsco River, the Francis Scott Key Bridge marks our approach to Baltimore. The bridge is named after Francis Scott Key, best known as the writer of the lyrics to the Star-Spangled Banner. It was from these waters Key watched the Battle of Baltimore into the night, then awoken by the dawn's early light to see the stars and stripes still flying over the city's Fort McHenry. It is remembered as one of the proudest moments in American history and just one of many moments in the unique and sometimes forgotten history of Baltimore. Baltimore was founded in 1729 by Lord Baltimore. Um, no one really wanted the land because it was, it was the, the soil was too poor to grow tobacco, which was the biggest cash crop of that time. So a lot of Germans and Scots moved in and were able to settle the cheap land. From there, people started to realize the, sim the city's proximity to water and how it was easy to, you know, be like an import, export type of town. And it was just a tremendous amount of opportunity, which eventually led to Baltimore being America's first boom town. Baltimore was actually the first city to reach a population of a million or more after uh, Manhattan and New York. And with this 18th century boom came a diversity in the demographic of the city. The growth of all these brand new businesses caused a lot of uh, people to sell their slaves and move a lot of slaves into the Baltimore area. A lot of those slaves were able to find jobs and they actually were able to make money and buy their own freedom and then buy freedom for their family and friends as well. In addition to being remembered for its role in the War of 1812, Baltimore was also key in the Civil War. Baltimore actually sided with the Union during the Civil War. Um, one of those reasons is we had such a large free black population here, so, so it only made sense. Even though um, some southern parts of the state sided with the Confederate, which is why, um, you know, our city is normally considered to be a place that's too north to be south and too south to be north. But in the 20th century, the city fell on tough times. One of the major things that really affected our city in a negative way was the failure to properly industrialize. So we did have some places like Can Company and Bethlehem Steel, but a lot of those factory jobs never ever really 
established a permanent home here. And, you know, we see some of the long-term effects of that. We tried, but it just, it just didn't work out. D. Watkins remembers those tough times vividly. I grew up in the height of the crack era. Um, I lost a lot of family members and a lot of friends. Uh, my, o my, own, my older brother who raised me, he passed away as a result of that lifestyle. And like many of my family and friends, I tried my own hand in trying to work that business. And I did that for a couple of years. And, you know, with love and support for family and friends, I, I made it out of that. Luckily, Watkins was able to make a change and is today part of a new generation of writers and filmmakers in the city. He's part of a new charge, looking to the future and offering young people opportunities Watkins himself never experienced. There's a collection of artists in Baltimore who um, participate in artivism, you know, activists through what we create. You got guys like myself, like Aaron Mabin, like Devin Allen, and David Manigo, and the Stokey Project. And all of these different people who um, we in incorporate social justice into the way we create. And it's a double-headed monster. So we're not only creating the content that's documenting this, 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 this time in Baltimore history, but then we're also teaching those skills to people coming up. When I was a kid growing up, at the height of the crack era, there was no, there was no, no writers, no artists, no filmmakers, nobody around to, to show us or, you know, or give us some examples of what does it take to make it as a successful artist or even to talk about how important art was. I think some of the work we do is very important as far as like developing the next generation of artists and creating and creative people and being those examples who can come in those neighborhoods and, and, and deliver those skills. Years after D. Watkins saw the poverty and crime of Baltimore's toughest neighborhoods firsthand, he says he still loves the city he calls home. Baltimore is a special place for me because, you know, beyond being my home, it's, it's, it's just a city that I love. It's a tough love city. You know, in most places, if you're trying to do something like I'm doing as a writer and a creative person, you know, you get love from your surrounding community members and they try to help propel you to the top. In Baltimore, that's not the case. They beat you down until you're good enough to get recognized around the world and then you get the love. So, you know, I love Baltimore for being a tough place. I love Baltimore for some of the things it exposed me to and just the resiliency that comes with being from this city. It's made me a very, very tough and patient person, which pays dividends in the art world because, um, you know, I can be rejected 20 million times and not feel a thing. And that comes from being from Baltimore. Moving northeast from Baltimore, we explore the northern reaches of the Chesapeake Bay. Here at the mouth of the Susquehanna River, the city of Havre de Grace is home to more than 13,000 people. The city is dotted by scenic marinas parks and the Concord Point Lighthouse. In 2014, Haver de Grace was named in Smithsonian Magazine's list of America's 20 best small towns to visit. And moving up the Susquehanna River, we get a unique bird's eye view of the multiple bridges linking Haver de Grace with the nearby town of Perryville. The Amtrak Susquehanna River Bridge stands on the site of the first railroad bridge to cross this river, with the Thomas J. Haddam Memorial Bridge a kilometer beyond. And just a half kilometer further upriver, the CSX Susquehanna River Bridge is another rail crossing, spanning the river via Garrett Island. A 
A bridge was first built here in 1886 by the historic B&O Railroad, then replaced with the current structure. Two dozen trains cross here each day, linking Philadelphia and Baltimore. Finally, the Millard E. Tidings Memorial Bridge is part of Interstate 95. It is the busiest of Havard or Gracie's four spans, with 29 million vehicles crossing each year. Beyond the bridges, we continue upriver, tracing the contours of the Susquehanna. At 747 kilometers in length, the Susquehanna is the longest river system on the East Coast that drains into the Atlantic. Amazingly, it is also considered one of the oldest river systems in the world. Geologists believe the Susquehanna was formed before the Appalachian Mountains surrounding, making it more than 300 million years old. In total, the river drains 71,000 square kilometers and flows through New York, Pennsylvania, and Maryland. And 15 kilometers from the mouth of the Susquehanna and the Chesapeake Bay, we experience the true power of this waterway from above. Here, US Route 1 meets the Conowingo Dam, a massive hydroelectric facility completed in 1928. At the time, it was the second largest facility of its kind in the United States after Niagara Falls. The dam creates a 310,000 acre reservoir upriver with 11 turbines at the southern end of the facility. On the northern half, 53 floodgates control the flow of water from the reservoir to the river below. In total, the Conowingo hydroelectric plant has a generating capacity of 527 megawatts. Finally, just north of the dam, we leave civilization behind and continue up the Susquehanna River. Here, the Susquehanna Reservoir is lined by farmland and forested tracts of land. And eight kilometers from the dam, we reach another political boundary as we leave Maryland and the Chesapeake Bay behind and enter the state of Pennsylvania. From the Chesapeake Delaware Canal, to the open waters of the Chesapeake Bay. To the spectacular contours of the Susquehanna River. The waterways of Maryland hold some of the most amazing coastal beauty on the entire East Coast. in the skies surrounding, we can truly appreciate the cultural stories of the past. From Maryland's rural eastern shore, to the heart of Baltimore, and experience the seafaring traditions of today in St. Michael's. Annapolis. And on open water.
a way of life that will continue to evolve into the future. Here on the edge of America.